So, hey Steven, thank you so much. I'm so pumped to have you today. Thank you so much for taking time out for this. I just want to start. I just, I just want to start with your like journey, the entire journey in the beginning, and then I would love to get into extract some insights out of it. And uh, there is a lot to learn. I have a lot of questions already prepared for you. So, amazing. Yeah, let's get started. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to be here. Thanks a lot for having me again, Akash. And uh, yeah, excited to dive a little deeper and share what I can. I think there's a lot. It's been a crazy last couple of months, uh, but I think there's a lot of uh, takeaways and, and learnings that we can all uh, benefit from. So to get started with, like, I, I want to understand how you got into coding, how you started. So funny thing, I actually learned how to code and program in the middle of the pandemic. That was back in 2020. I remember I was trying to basically build a simple application to find available one word domain names for a different side project that I had at the time. And that was my first ever web project. Before then, I didn't really know how to build applications. I did have like a data science background. So I would do like run Python scripts inside Jupyter Notebooks. And at one point I just got tired of not being able to build something that end users can actually use and interact with. So I taught myself the code. I use basically just HTML, CSS and jQuery good old jQuery and also Flask for the back end. So it's nothing like none of those like sexy frameworks nowadays. And that really taught me a lot about how to build a functioning application that has authentication, billing and everything built in. So it was a it was a really good like learning experience. And from that, surprisingly, the project actually took off. I, I launched it on ProductCon. It got to number two of product of the day and even got onto the front page of Hacker News and it, it basically started taking mm -hmm. on momentum and a lot of traction then. So that was like my first project and uh, yeah, the rest is history. Exciting. And then how it, you got into Vercel because you started coding and then you joined Vercel as a <laughs> <Dave Ray. laughs> up there. Um Yeah, that's a great question. So what happened was I remember I was building more domains at the time, that first project of mine. And at one point I really wanted to turn it into like a, you know, a, like a full on venture backed business. And before I started fundraising, I remember I reached out to Vercel because they had a domains product and we were a domains, you know, platform. So I wanted to like do some partnerships with them. I remember I sent an email to partnerships of Vercel. They never responded. And a week later I, I reached out to Guillermo, founder of Vercel directly. And he actually responded and he was like, we're not focused on domains at the moment, but we'll have to get to know you and the company. So we went, uh, we basically had a two Zoom calls. And then when I got to SF, we went out for donuts, Bob's Donuts, shout out to that place. <laughs> and yeah, so basically got to know each other. And then when I was about to close the pre-seed round for, at the time it was Warm Domains, he basically reached out and he was like, why don't you join Resell instead and, and use this as an opportunity to kickstart your career and learn more about B2B sales, about uh, fundraising, hiring, managing people. And at the time, the project that I joined to build was the platform starter kit. And I can go more into that a bit later, but it basically was this template and, and like product that allowed people to build multi-tenant applications on top of Resell's infrastructure. So it was essentially the premise was I would build a startup inside Resell which is kind of cool. So that was when I decided to join. And yeah, looking back, it was probably the best decision I could have made at the time, given that first, Warmer Domains was not really a venture backable product. On hindsight, I realized that. And at the same time, like the amount of focus that require that and maturity as well, that is, is required to build a business is, I don't think I had that back then. And looking back, I think Rissell really gave me that foundation, ability to actually start a company eventually. It feels like, Vercel has a lot to do for where you are right now. That was your first job? Essentially, yes. I think what I did like do like some contract work before I was, you know, if you want to go back to my first ever job, I was like this tour guide. <laughs> back in the day, I was in high school working part time. But like over time, like I did do some like contract work, but not really anything in software engineering, to be honest. Like it was a lot of like, like I did, I was exposed to like the startup culture Early in my university journey, uh, we were building this NFT marketplace in 2018, 
in Tokyo of all places, super random. But that was like my first foray into entrepreneurship. And I really enjoyed the ability to be very scrappy and resourceful and not having this like structure that you get from like a big tech company if you work at Google and stuff like that. So naturally I gravitated towards startups and, and Versailles at the time, and uh, this was 2021, I believe, they, were, they raised a series C. So not technically a startup, but when I joined, there were like 80 people and they grew to 400 plus uh, within during my time there. So it was a pretty big transition. So yeah, technically it was my first official job <laughs> and definitely gave me a lot of experience yeah. and, and learn, I learned a ton from that. You moved to US in 2020 to San Francisco? Or yeah, so when was uh, that time? it's a long story. Uh, you can go back a few years. So I yeah. went to college in the US and sort of stuck around. The, the college I went to, I started uh, it back in 2017. It was this university called Minerva. It's one of the actually one of the top like competitive schools. But the premise is students travel to a different country every semester. So we start out in San Francisco, <laughs> right in the middle of like Market Street, kind of crazy. I don't. And then we moved to countries like Seoul, South Korea, and, and Berlin, Germany, India as well, Hyderabad, uh, Argentina, uh, Buenos Aires, all these different cities across the world to basically live, work, and learn in, in, uh, as a cohort. So like we travel with our class. And that was four years. Ended back up in San Francisco. As I mentioned earlier, I also got that startup experience in Tokyo. That was like in the first or second year. So yeah, basically came to US for college and basically stuck around. And I think it's still the, the greatest place to be when it comes to if you want to build a tech company, just from the connections and, and network and just the culture of builders here. It's, I, I couldn't find it anywhere else, even when I was in Tokyo and all these different amazing cities. I want to like drill down a bit on this aspect of, you know, moving to San Francisco. What do you like love about it? Because I know there are gray side as well and people and on the internet, people love to like, you know grab attention by talking about that. But there is this really, really bright side as well, which I am also experiencing right now. Uh, mm -hmm. What What do you think? Like, how when when someone wants to, let's say, if someone is trying to prepare to move to San Francisco, uh, what they should be prepared for? That's a great question. I think over the years, I realized that San Francisco is definitely one of the best places if you want to immerse yourself in this builder culture there are so many like just people building all the time and you sort of get that vibe and like the environment and atmosphere though a caveat that i would mention is that to build a successful company you don't necessarily need to be in san francisco so for example a great case study is is uh, laravel they recently raised a pretty good like amazing C series a and prior to that they were already making a ton of money uh, they were bootstrapped and they were, I think they are based entirely out of, I forgot which, which city, but it was not in this, in San Francisco. So there's definitely pros and cons. Like San Francisco is, it might seem like it's a amazing city for builders, but there's obviously pro, like cons to it when it comes to like safety and like getting all this homeless stuff going on. If you're coming to San Francisco, I think you should come with an intention to build and to with the intention to meet incredible people you can meet a lot of uh, amazing founders and people that are in your shoes or maybe a couple of years ahead where they're building like a series b company or whatever you can meet all these people in this amazing city and the outdoors here is fantastic and i think that's that's one of the things that, that i really enjoy about it it's like being able to go on walks go on runs and hikes and beaches so that's definitely a pro and yeah i think yeah it's, it's a fantastic city for building Awesome. And I now want to move back to our getting started into Versal. How was your role? What was your day-to-day -day life used to look like when it was in Versal? Sure. So my time at Versal was very eventful. Like I learned a lot in a very short amount of time. And I would say it sort of evolved over time. In the beginning, it was very autonomous where I was in charge of building out the platforms product being able to like so to talk more about that it's basically a product for website builders or even link link management platforms like dub to be able to build multi-tenant applications on top of our sales infrastructure so the, i was sort of like the like tech lead for that product and i got to like build everything from scratch and, and document it create guides for it create marketing content for it so it was a very like 
autonomous and all-rounded role in that case. And then over time, it evolved into building out like the templates marketplace, for example. And that was more like also very engineering heavy, but at the same time focused on programmatic SEO. Yeah, it was, it was, I would say it's a very, it was a very autonomous uh, experience. Like I got to experiment and build without a lot of like direction. Uh, obviously there was like some discussions, but it was ultimately the execution and implementation was what came down to, to me to, to, to execute it. So yeah, that was pretty much the experience and yeah, it was, it was really fun. Awesome. And I know it's an incredible team at Versal. There are really, really incredible indie hackers, uh, builders who work at Versal. I want to understand like your experience with working with this very highly talented folks at there, or maybe if you want to give a shout out to a couple of them who must have some impact on, on your journey so far. Yeah, hundred percent. I think Vercel did a really good job with hiring founder types, like people who are indie hackers and build a ton of amazing projects. Obviously, like the famous ones, like Shatsi and you probably know. Uh, it was really fun getting to work with with people like that, and also Hank, who was there. He was basically my manager under the growth organization at at Vercel. And he gave a lot of like, he was really good at like leading and managing a team and giving a lot of great advice. Lee Rob, obviously, uh, he is uh, one of the best, probably the best developer advocate I know. He was a great leader as well. And, um, and I got to learn a lot from that. And there's a ton. I cannot like name everyone. There are a lot of both like amazing design engineers, amazing designers, amazing backend engineers, infrastructure engineers, like so many incredible people. And I think that's why by starting my career there and getting to learn from the best in the industry was the right choice for me personally. And I, I got to really learn and, and, and build relationships, build relationships with these people. And how helpful was that entire experience of having that autonomy of building helped you transition from a DevRel or, or your role at Versal, uh, transitioning from that to being a founder. Uh, but I think just before that, I just want to come back. Uh, how Dub started? I, I think it's it was a tiny side project. And I, I want to understand like how exactly, but when, how it all started and how it then graduated to what it is today. Yeah, 100%. So I can talk about the, the founding story here. So Dub started, as, as you said, it started as a side project of mine when I was at Vercel. I mainly built it to sort of learn the new technologies that we were launching at the time, specifically edge middleware and edge functions. Being able to do uh, really low latency redirects at the edge, really close to the users. That was like my foray into learning how everything worked. And, and I launched it as an open source project since day one. It took off. It uh, basically... I think it was number one on Hack News for a couple of hours, and it got on to get up trending and all these different um, cool places. So yeah, it, it, it was a really, it, it took off really well, and it was just a side project at, at, at the beginning. And I would just spend like evenings and weekends building it out and, and listening to the customer feedback and starting to iterate the product. Over time, it took a while actually for me to sort of realize potential behind dub and and the moment when it clicked for me is when i realized that people were using dub to build to basically track the affiliate uh clicks and earnings and the affiliate space happens to be a space that i'm deeply intimate and familiar with because prior to resell with one domains i would participate in all these different like affiliate programs from godaddy namecheap all these different domain registrars and they would use these platforms that looked like they were built in like the 2000s or like 1990s. This is really, really legacy, antiquated platforms with pretty much no developer experience. Some of them even use like SOAP XML for the API, which is mind boggling. So I realized that it's a space that's ripe for disruption. There's a lot of, uh, there's not enough like good products and platforms in this space. And Dub was positioned really well as a link management platform, being able to track attribution and conversion is just like the natural evolution of Dub as a product, like extending our link infrastructure to be able to track all that. That's when it clicked. And earlier this year, basically January 2024, I, I basically left and started a company around Dub. And yeah, the rest is history. It's been it's been a crazy last couple of months. And I think to go back to your question, what uh, my time at Vercel 
given that how like given how autonomous it was, like I had to like figure out how to launch the products I was building at Vercel, the platform starter kit, the templates marketplace, being able to market and build is is a very unique set of set of strengths that makes you a successful founder. Like I think there was this I'm not sure if it's a tweet or a quote, but like learn how to build, learn how to design and learn how to sell or something like that. I think the second one might have been learn how to write. But like being able to build and market what you're building is how you can become a successful founder. A lot of founders, some of them are either too technical and don't know how to sell or too uh, marketing focused and don't know how to build. So that my time at Vercel really taught me both sides of the spectrum. And I think that's why I was able to hit the ground running when I started Dub as a company and had had a like, basically a insane amount of growth trajectory in the last couple of months. So yeah. Yeah, I mean I can I can clearly see that the the speed at which you folks are shipping things and I'm seeing doublings everywhere now. Uh, even on peer list people are sharing their even if they are simply sharing their articles, they go to dub, get their short link and they share that. So I I really want to understand like there were products like dub earlier, maybe like link shortness we would say. Uh, how you differentiate it from them because i can clearly see there is a fan base for dub uh, because if you go and if you search for that you will see a lot of tweets you know talking really really fondly about dub. and that's there how you did your devrel experience help you with that you're launching you're building site multiple site projects and launching them how that how you set that narrative that you know this is the most lovable product you could have great question i think I think definitely my my experiences at Devrel at Vercel they give me that their foundation, uh, but I think ultimately uh, it's this appreciation for good design, and that, that sort of like built that uh, culture or like um, like you said fan base or community around Dub, and the fact that it's open source it's also a big thing. People love talking about something that's open source, privacy focused, and stuff like that, and. Uh, and I think combining all these different factors is sort of what led to where Dub is today. So I can talk about like the design side of things. Like we really emphasize on good design. We recently launched like, a comparison page with like existing link platforms such as Bitly, re- like Rebrandly, Short.io, and we have this section where it's like a comparison slider that shows you the difference between our platform and the competitors and you can see a clear difference in the the ui and how everything looks uh and that's sort of like one of the main factors that one of the main differentiators that we have we have really good design and uh really good focus on developer experience as well we have native sdks for typescript python go uh, and ruby and we're launching one for php pretty soon and uh so being able to like tap into the developer side of things uh, give developers a really easy way to integrate link management into their existing infrastructure is definitely a recipe for building a, a strong community around your product. People underrate like the value or, or the role that developers play in software. Uh, I think in the past, people have always been like, oh, it's a marketer, so they make a decision. But at the end of the day, you really do need to have a good developer experience for a product to be successful. And I think as well as obviously being able to resonate with those marketers and, and give them the reason to uh, to actually buy your product. So I think, yeah, having a good design, great uh, developer experience and being open source were definitely some of the main factors that led to where Dubs today. Oh, you talked about design, right? And I'm a big, big fan of well-designed products. Uh, and we have seen this trend now. Even the very, very early stage products are well-designed and that becomes one of the differentiator for them. How, if, if I, and I see a lot of engineers undervalue these things while designing or building their side projects. I want you to, you know, give them a convincing pitch that why they should also think about design as a differentiator while building side projects. Yeah, 100%. I think I can sum it all up to one phrase. First impressions matter. No matter how good your infrastructure or LLM or all your different like backend stuff is, if your front end looks terrible, no one's going to pay attention to 
the superior backend that you've built. So re you really need to nail down that first impression aspect. And sometimes it plays as a double-edged sword. I've done this myself. I've I've been like, oh my God, this product's amazing because it looks really good from a design perspective. And the backend turned out not to be as good uh, as the competition. But that's exactly why like people really gravitate towards the product that, the products that are well-designed. And being able to incorporate that into your product since day one. And I think I'm a big fan of what you guys are doing at Purely is because of that, like the design and thought that goes into building the product out, it's very palpable. Like when you log in and go through the onboarding flow and set up your company profile, it's like so well thought out, so much easier to use than LinkedIn and all these different like antiquated older solutions out there. So there's definitely a huge advantage you can even call it a competitive edge uh, to having good design uh, because that's what gets you the word of mouth that people are like, oh my God, this is great. I'm going to tell my friends. And you don't need to pay for that, right? That's people, organic growth and word of mouth and, and product-led growth is exactly what comes from good design as well. So yeah, that's basically my pitch. So <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, this is exactly what I always try to convey to folks who are building side projects. I have like Two more questions. One is why someone should build side projects? Because for you, it turned out really well. So what is what is your take on that? Yeah, my oh. take on that is side projects are a fantastic way for, okay, there are two sides, right? For a company, side projects are good if they dock for the product. So for example, like right now we are, we built like this side project called OSS Gallery, which is like this collection of open source projects that are, that are out there. And we basically dog fooded our analytics API to display real time click data of people clicking on the GitHub button on those projects or like the website, like basically emulating what it looks like from Product Hunt's perspective. If you launch a product on Product Hunt, people click on it, land on your site, those click data. Imagine being able to display that to the makers. So that's sort of like what we did to demo our, our um, analytics API. And then from my employees perspective, like someone who, if you're working at a company and you're building side projects, obviously it's, it's really smart to also dog food the, the technology. That's how I started building that, right? I was that dog fooding Rizal's edge functions, edge middleware. And it really gives you a deeper understanding into the business side of things at the company, especially if you are. If you are an engineer and you're not very involved a lot in those business conversations, being able to build a side project that uses your company's technologies, you can see that like value proposition and make you a much better engineer or a product person even. We're launching this new product called DAP Conversions. It's basically an extension of our existing link infrastructure to be able to understand what happens after a click. Do people sign up for your product? Do they upgrade to a paid plan? Do they expand or do they churn afterwards. So that entire flow is basically what we want to visualize. And I've been basically integrating this, this technology into some of my older side projects, one more domains, for example, uh, extrapolate, which is another like AI project that I built in the past. I'm not working on them like actively anymore, but being able to dog food these products into those side projects really gave me insight into which part of the product, which part of this, the, the, the conversion tracking API needs to be improved. And I think we also, we are also actually dog footing this to build our own referral program. And this really gave us a lot of like, you know, product feedback that we can give ourselves without needing to talk to users. Obviously we do still do that, but I think side projects is a great way to get product feedback. So yeah, highly recommend that. And yeah. Yeah, I think one of the biggest problem which I had as a founder when we don't have a marketing team is that how we can measure the ROI on the efforts which we are putting. So do you think this dub conversion is going to help us with that? Let's say if we are doing a really good investment on the marketing and the campaigns and how, where this will help us to, you know, figure out okay, we have this much of conversion happened and we spent this much and this much sell we did. Yeah, 100%. So there are two different use cases for DAP conversions. One is to build like a referral program that lives directly into your application. I think Purelace already has a has a really nice one. You guys have different milestones for people you refer. And then I think the next step that you can benefit from DAP conversions is if they were to you know sign up for a uh, create a company account and check out and purchase a job posting and stuff like that the entire flow understanding not just signups but also revenue i think that's that's a very key piece of data they can get from that 
And then the, the other uh, the other use case would be like for understanding attribution from either paid ads or organic social posts. Like for example, you launch a new feature on Twitter and LinkedIn and email newsletter, you have these different channels to understand like which channels are converting to signups the best. And eventually, you know, which channels are converting to companies that are purchasing job postings and stuff like that. So that's definitely something that you can use as well, as well as paid ads, right? Like Twitter ads, LinkedIn ads, Facebook ads, being able to like accurately understand how these clicks are actually converting to revenue. I think like these ad platforms, they give you solutions to do that, but there are two sort of downsides to that. One is like, it's from them. So you might not be able to trust if they are reporting it correctly, they might be overinflating it. So having Dub as a third party would be super helpful. And second, we do everything on the server side. Like we track conversion signups uh, on the server side and the Stripe part, like for for like sale conversion, we listen to Stripe webhooks, which is also on the server side happens asynchronously in the background. As a result of all that, like the data that you get is very accurate and you can trust and you can even see like the user journey over time. Like for example, we had someone sign up through like a dub conversion power link we saw that they sign up on pro and then they upgraded to business and they've been paying business for two to three months now. And it's like this entire journey to be able to understand that it's super, super helpful. So yeah, basically that's how you can benefit from that conversion. Because we're talking about this. I remember we become the customer last year, June or July in 23. I remember like it was quite an early days for them, but you guys had pricing plans. You can go and become upgrade to pro. Mm-hmm. I have seen or noticed that many of the engineers, when they are building side projects, they're a bit hesitant to start monetizing uh, right away. And this, and many of the type people do have questions like, when is the right time I should monetize my side project? What what made you realize that you know I know what value I am giving, and mm-hmm. uh, when is the right time to start you know charging your customers? Yeah, that's a great question. I think monetization shouldn't be seen as like this taboo thing. Instead, it should be seen as a good thing. Because like if I see a project that's completely free and there's no clear path to monetization, I'm skeptical because that's, it's, it's, there's this famous saying where if the product is free, you're the product. Like they basically monetize you by either selling ads or uh, if they really are like focused on transparency and they don't sell ads, they don't monetize at all, the project would probably shut down in a year or two just because it's not sustainable, right? You need to, to build a sustainable business. You need a good monetizing strategy. And it's definitely, it's something that takes a lot of experimentation to get right. Honestly, I don't think we've gotten it right yet at Dub. But I remember in, in the early days when I first launched Dub, it was like super simple product. And then we had a free plan. And then the next plan was like, $99 a month and people were like, what the heck? $99 for a link shortener. And like people were just very skeptical. So like we had to iterate on that and come up with different tiers. And over time we sort of got like a nice little, like nice pricing structure go- going on. Uh, but as we were launching this top conversions feature, we, we will have to like, you know, rethink that model a little bit. And yeah, it takes a lot of like experimentation and talking to users and, and figuring out what the, the, the best ways to go, but it shouldn't be seen as taboo because it's actually something that customers value. And when they pay for your product, they put more value on it and they will use it more often as opposed to if it's a completely free product, they're like, okay, cool, I'll sign up for now. And then maybe I'll use it like one weekend when I'm free. So like, it's not very like usage wise, you don't really get a lot of um, good, you know, data on that as well. So yeah, hundred percent think about monetization from day one. And don't be afraid to experiment and try out different things. I'm glad we signed up for the paid plan very early. And, uh, and I we really are on the, appreciate that. <laughs> and Thank we you. are on the legacy uh, plan right now. But yep. I think Dub is the first or second product after we started We at least. No way. Like, where we onboarded uh, for a paid plan. It's uh, amazing. And I was, uh, of course, like because of the design and because of the way it was working and how simply it was to onboard and start, you know, using it made me like, you know, it's worth it. And I I just, I'm proud of my decision. Now, 
and uh, i want to like uh, ask you one more thing because of your first project was like one word domain and then uh, there are really really good domains which you own i want to your love for domain is there and i have seen so many people fondly and very excitedly talk about all these domains because of the various perspective what is like why someone should invest on a domain name yeah that's a great question i actually was just doing a different interview with domain blog over the weekend we touched on this as well so i think my experience with domains at warmer domains really gave me the experience and understanding to be successful with dub so and, and why do i say that it's because as we've we've launched a bunch of i'm not sure if you saw but we've launched a few like branded short links on dub for example we have a github link shortener git.new we have a spotify one which is like spti dot fi so like all these different weird and creative tlds and domains i think i wouldn't have known that all of these existed and there's a way to get them without having a background and understanding of domains obviously domains has become more and more of a commodity so i think like people unless if it's like you know warmwood.com or warmwood.ai people don't want to pay as much so it doesn't really make sense to build a product specifically in domains anymore but i think with links and being able to turn these domains into infinite number of links like each link is just just a different permutation on the path that comes after the domain there is basically opens up so many different possibilities either you're building just like a short link for your marketing team to be able to use on on social media or you're integrating it natively into your platform like i remember we chatted about integrating pl.st into peerless to programmatically shorten links on on the platform there's just so many different use cases uh, that stems all the way like the at the core of it as a domain and then on top of his links and then there's just a ton of use cases and i think another thing that we've been experimenting with um is wildcard subdomain so like if you add a domain to to do dub like for example i don't know example.com you can do subdomains on top of that and each of them would essentially be a link right there's just so many different things you can do and it all comes back down to domains tlds and links so like it's it's the core and fundamental part of the internet and that's why like we're so excited for the future of dub because links are a fundamental component of the web and being able to turn each link into from like a just a resource locator url to a full attribution engine that's sort of like the pitch that we give is 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 very exciting there's so many ideas that we have like we're going to be exploring each of them in the future but being able to like for example like if you have a website and being able to understand how the user interacts with different pages and eventually signs up for an account like this multi touch attribution strategy that people talk about it's it's feasible with with our technology that we're building at dub with like the link infrastructure that we have so yeah anyways going back to your question domains are definitely at the root of everything and i think links is like the the second layer on top of that and then everything in the internet is built on top of these two so yeah that's that's basically you pushed me to buy that short domain <laughs> uh field.st and uh, i think yeah when you when you did that i was like okay let's let's go and do it and and i i'm proud of that decision it it actually put us how uh, peop- the way people perceive when they look at the domain is different when we are doing that and uh, even internally now now we'll be moving to you know use that in a programmatic way uh, whenever somebody is sharing the post or the projects from peer list to outside and of course dub uh, is there to uh, help us out i have like couple of like last questions Mm-hmm. One is like, what advice uh, you will give for someone who is transitioning from being a developer, uh, being an engineer to a founder? Because there are many other roles who can transition. I think I would say quite easily into this role, but for engineers, I think there is a bit of struggle. So, what advice you will have for them? What are the things they should unlearn and then learn? Yeah, I think for. for an engineer transitioning to who wants to like become like more of an entrepreneur and founder i think there are a few things like you should definitely take a lot of inspiration from the indie hacker community i think a lot of folks there are incredibly 
good at monetizing and, and building successful businesses. Some that come to mind, obviously, Levels IO and, and Mark uh, Louvion. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Uh, a lot of incredible, like Damon, I think, uh, founder of Testimonial, like all these different uh, amazing indie hackers and entrepreneurs. They all started from an engineering background. And another thing uh, when it comes to that is not obsessing over your tech stack. I think a lot of people, a lot of engineers tend to over-engineer. And as a result, not spend enough time marketing the product and getting people excited about it. And that's the constant struggle that we have adopted too, where it's like, okay, we want to build something that scales really well and have good like engineering pr practices. But sometimes you also need to like be able to move fast and potentially like just refactor it later. So you're like, definitely uh, focus on monetization since day one and not over-engineer a tech stack. <laughs> I think that's the main advice I would give. If you want to define what is Dub, uh, briefly, what is that? So Dub is a link management platform for modern marketing teams to be able to build marketing campaigns, link sharing features, or referral programs. We are loved and used by amazing companies such as Product Hunt, Perplexity, Vercel, and Raycast. And uh, the sort of idea or the big vision that we have for Dub is turning every URL or link on the web from being just a resource locator into an end-to-end -end attribution engine, being able to understand how your link clicks are actually converting to signups and eventually to paying customers. So that's a big vision. And there are a lot of products that we're building at the moment that basically complements the entire ecosystem. And yeah, we're very excited to build the link management platform uh, and attribution platform of the future. Awesome. I think I'm also excited to see because I have been part of your journey. I would say that since like a couple of years now uh, when you started and seeing the growth, which is like exponential, like you have been constantly sharing the numbers, like how many links getting tracked. By the way, like um, I would love to uh, understand some numbers here because you have been scaling very rapidly. So let's let's compare like how much numbers of like links created and track last month versus this month? Mm -hmm. um, so I think last month we created about 50,000 links, I believe, and we had around 10.5 million tracked clicks. I think this month is going to be higher. Last I checked the rolling 30-day count for the number of clicks. Let me just pull that out real quick. I believe it's 13.3 million. So yeah, it's going to be much higher this month, probably around 15, 16. I don't know, but it's, it's been growing really rapidly. And I think it's because we've been onboarding a lot of like bigger customers and we actually closed our first official enterprise deal recently. And I think that really drove the amount of click usage. They use a ton of clicks every single month. So I think, yeah, that's, that's uh, super exciting for, for the growth side of things as well. Awesome. Uh, I just have one last uh, question. Mm -hmm. uh, you have been surrounded by Dub is an open source project and uh, you have this community of open source and some side projects as well. Can you define like what exactly is commercially open source softwares? Yeah, great question. So commercial open source software or COS for short is essentially products that are open core and what that means is like companies that have their product fully open source and they monetize either through a hosted version or by selling enterprise uh, licenses for companies like like for larger corporations or governments that want to self-host the product there are two like these two different monetizing strategies some companies um basically have a even split between these two I think Calicom does really well. They have a lot of amazing like enterprise licenses. Formbricks is a, I'm, I'm good friends with the founder as well. They also do a lot of both side of things. I think at Dub we're more focused on uh, the hosted version. Uh, we have some like enterprise licenses, but not a lot. Bulk of revenue comes from the hosted version, and I think there there's uh, different ways to do things. And I think open source is definitely a great way to build both like a community transparency as well we've had people ask for like oh are you guys SOC to compliant or gdpr compliant and i'm like yes and you can just check out our code base it's fully fully um, open source and you can audit it anytime you want it really helps build 
transparency, especially when it comes to enterprise sales. And also at the same time, it's just, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic way to build secure software. And I think Mark Zuckerberg famously say that open source software is secure by default and more secure than closed source software, simply because of the fact that open source software, uh, every single change you make needs to be fully audited because like it's, it goes out to the public and 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 community also like keeps an eye out on like different things that if there are any security vulnerabilities, uh, people will let you know. So, so yeah, it's it's a lot of great advantages to building open source software. Cool. Uh, I think awesome. Uh, thank you so great. much for your like being gracious with your time. Of course. Thanks for having me. Uh, it was it was really great. I actually wanted to talk to you for a very long time. Me too. But I know uh, you have been busy. You have just transitioned into this full time founder mode. So yeah, but thank you so much and all the best, all the best for uh, Dub, all the best for the future. And I am 200% sure for uh, Dub is going to rocket. Uh, so all the best on that. Thank you. Thank you so much again for having me. And I likewise, I'm a, I'm a big fan of what you, what you guys are building at Pure List and I'm rooting for you guys. And uh, yeah, very excited to see where you guys go with this. And uh, we're very excited to be powering short links for you guys too. And, and potentially in the future, like a uh, full conversion tracking stuff too. So, so yeah, thanks again for having me. And uh, yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much too.